Berserk feels like a gory murder fest if you're looking at it from the surface, but when you get deeper into the series, you realize that it's a fictional reflection of many prevalent world beliefs. The main story's setting might be medieval European in nature, but there are many cultures that are at work here as well, inspiring everything about the series, from its architecture to its mythology. Kentaro Miura was an artist that believed in the confluence of overlapping ideas spilling forth from the sea of diversity, and one of the biggest examples of this is the World Tree. It appears in the aftermath of Femto triggering the great roar of the astral world, and has become a central part of the world itself. But how did this happen? Why did this happen? And what went behind the conceptualization of such a spiritual anchor? We'll take a look at all that and more in this video. When did the World Spiral Tree first appear? How was it created? For a structure that has become as central to the events of Berserk as the World Spiral Tree, it sure took a long time to show up in the story. Its first appearance was in Chapter 306, but in true Miura fashion, the mangaka had laid the groundwork for it well before that. Our first hint that a World Tree-like structure was about to hit the world came when we were introduced to Flora and her Spirit Tree Mansion. Flora lives in a part of the Berserkverse where the borders between the physical and astral world overlap with each other quite heavily. She took up residence in the forest near Enoch Village centuries ago, and mortals could only find her lair when she wished for it. As a sorceress, Flora was painfully aware of the perception the Holy See had spread throughout the world when it came to her kind. So she set up borders that protected her from the people, and vice versa for what that's worth, but another reason for her setting up those borders was that she was the guardian of the spirit tree, around which her mansion had been constructed. As you guys are probably aware of by this point, there are two distinct dimensions in the world of Berserk, the physical and the astral. The physical world is the one where humans reside and physical activities cause physical events. The astral world is where magic exists, where thoughts and emotions rule, and where one learns to explore from within the confines of their own mind. A thousand years before the current timeline of the series, these two worlds coexisted, and magical beasts were as commonplace in the world as men. However, once Supreme King Geisrich's continental empire fell, these two worlds were largely separated from one another. And thanks to the rapid spread of Holy Sea propaganda, the astral world was soon forgotten. Spirit trees were one of the final remnants of those olden days, and the lingering effects of such trees can be found in regions with powerful magic in the world of Berserk. The Misty Valley is one such place, because even without a clearly defined spirit tree, it functions like an interstice. Puck notes that the flow of time there is rather similar to his homes, that being the mythical island of Elfhelm. Godot's Ormine likely had such a tree back in the day, which explains why Casca was safe in that cave, even though elves did not live there any longer. But these locations were dormant for many, many years. It was only with the rebirth of Griffith as Femto that they became active again, be that narratively or literally. And that brings us to how the world Spiral Tree was created and brought into the physical world. Even before his physical incarnation, Griffith's reincarnation as a God Hand member had immense implications for the fate of the world. Once he came into it again, his very presence started transforming it. Previously, coming across a magically charged location was difficult, and finding magical beasts next to impossible. Following his incarnation, trolls and kelpies and ogres started becoming common sightings in the world. The reason is simple. Femto becoming Griffith again started melting the borders between the physical and astral worlds. But, in order to annihilate them, the God Hand member needed to rip the bandaid off these barriers and cause a full merger. This couldn't be achieved with his presence alone, because that in itself took an amount of sacrifice one can't really scrounge up on an off day. Check out our video on the Incarnation Ceremony to find out more about that. To remove the lines between the astral and the physical worlds, he would have had to open up a giant interstice, and that is exactly what he accomplishes with the great roar of the astral world. Griffith combines the concept of a behelot's core function with the powers of Skull Knight's sort of actuation to basically reverse the former's primary job description. Only he uses a byproduct of a man-made behelot to do so. In the very first arc of Berserk, we saw the God Hand try to force the Slug Count into accepting a second reincarnation by sacrificing his daughter, but the reasons for the same weren't clear in 1989. They became evident when we saw Femto deliver lines akin to a prophecy. At the moment, he was about to cause the Great Roar. He claimed that the body of one that had been reincarnated twice and a sword strike that reaches deeper still into the depth would open the door to the other world. That's the literary description of the World Tree's creation, so what's the practical one? Well, to put it simply, he used a body that was linked to the depths of the astral world and a weapon that led directly to the abyss to merge the two dimensions of the Berserkverse. For the former, he used the forcibly reincarnated body of Kushan Emperor Ganeshka, who had plunged himself into the man-made behelot to gain power greater than a god hand's. In truth, 
He ended up becoming a massive sealed portal of sorts to the astral world. This is because when a behlet is put to use, it links the interior of an apostle's body to the abyss itself, and that must be especially true for one that has been reincarnated twice. To bring that out of him, Griffith manipulated the space-splitting sword stroke from Skull Knight's sword of actuation to kill Ganeshka, because regular weapons would have, number one, been useless, and number two, not caused a global interstice, which was his goal. We've all seen what happens when Guts kills an apostle. Its soul is sucked into the abyss, but nothing comes out. That would likely be the case for any regular apostle if he used the sword of actuation on them as well. But Ganeshka is a special case, for all the reasons we've already established. When Femto kills him with the sword of actuation's power, he opens the door to the astral world and ushers in the Age of Darkness by placing the world in a state of Fantasia. The astral world completely merges with the physical world, bringing fantastic beasts into reality and eliminating your need to find them. Locations that were previously only charged up with astral energy now become hotspots, and Ganeshka's body itself is transformed into the biggest hotspot of them all. After his death, the Dread Emperor's massive body is turned into a tree of gargantuan proportions. This luminescent tree, whose trunk is shaped like a double helix, extends far up into the heavens. Its branches cover the entire sky, and on clear nights, Sailors use them in place of constellations for navigation. It truly feels like the center of the new world, and that's not a coincidence. We'll explain what we mean by that in a few moments, but for now, let's pivot from how the world tree was created, to what it was inspired by, and how it actually works. What makes the world spiral tree similar to Yggdrasil? How does this explain its inner workings? The first chapter that reveals the world spiral tree to us in its full regalia is chapter 307, where Miura Sensei makes it a point to compare it to other important trees from real world mythologies and religions. He compares the world tree to three in particular, Yggdrasil, the Bodhi tree under which Buddha gained enlightenment, and the tree of life from the Kabbalah. Miura says the world spiral tree resembles the northern tree of myth, which pierces through the heavens and the depths of the western tree of ritual, which signifies the reason of all creation. Miura then equates the world tree with the essence of the word tree itself, and claims that it was as if it were rooted within the origin of all mankind. From the reaction of the humans and the apostles gathered underneath it, you can tell that all of this is likely true, but how does it play out in practice? We'll explain. Let's look at the evidence for the world spiral tree being similar to Yggdrasil. This is perhaps the one tree that can be replaced with the world tree from Berserk, and you honestly wouldn't be able to tell the difference. That's because, like Yggdrasil, Ganeshka's photosynthesizing corpse connects different realms into one cohesive world. But unlike the nine realms from Norse mythology, which rest on the different branches of Yggdrasil, the world spiral tree brings all other metaphysical planes into the physical. It's kinda like the Yggdrasil from the God of War video games, except you don't need realm travel because all the realms are layered on top of one another, interacting with each other at all times. It works out in the case of Berserk because here, there are only three distinct dimensions, two of which we've already mentioned. The third is the world of ideas, which hasn't been expanded upon at all so far in the series, except for being described as the soul that is the origin of all existence by Shirke one time. However, we do get a hint that the world has been linked to the physical plane as well, when Miura calls the world tree the very essence of a tree. The ideal world is based upon platonic idealism, which believes that most objects in this world have a metaphysical form that isn't permanent and true, and all material representations of it are mere interpretations. Think of an apple for a second. Now, we can't say why, but most of you would have had the same picture of a crisp, bright red apple pop up in your brain when we made that request, but according to platonic idealism, that's because the bright red apple is the ideal form of an apple that resides in all of our heads. That logic is kept consistent with Miura's description of the world spiral tree as being the very essence of a tree, and though we have no idea how this world of ideas is going to be represented in the series, we suspect we'll find out soon enough. Coming back from that short detour, there are other ways in which the world spiral tree represents Yggdrasil as well. The biggest one being the fact that it allows people who have a high enough sense of the arcane arts to use its branches as fast travel points. The world tree doesn't just bridge the three worlds together, it also provides pathways through which one might traverse the world. Because this tree has its roots in the astral world, those paths are the two major pathways of said world, the elf path and the dragon path. The elf path is a gateway to the astral world that can be sensed and discovered easily by those who are sensitive to magic. You don't need formal training to walk this path. Even a passing interest in the supernatural could be enough for it to present itself to you. The dragon path refers to the deeper, more intricate pathway of the astral world 
that leads to primordial locations like the Abyss. The astral world is like an iceberg in that the elf path opens you up to the tiny tip that is exposed on the top, and the dragon path hits you in the face with the true monstrosity hidden beneath the surface. It takes real skill with the arcane arts to even dare traverse this path, but if you can discern the subtle flow of Ode and follow it to your destination, it opens up a world of possibilities for you travel-wise. We've seen a few characters with immense astral powers like Griffith and Zod use these possibilities to their advantage already. While Zod being able to ride the branches of the World Tree remains suspect within the Berserk community, there is no doubt that Griffith can walk the dragon path with effortless ease, because we've seen him do it a few times already. Every time the Moonlight Boy shows up in front of Guts's party from out of nowhere, it's actually because he shares a body with Griffith, and both of them can read the pathways of the World Spiral Tree like an open book. It takes a skilled mage like Shirke an entire magical ritual to access the Dragon Path, but there is a simpler way to do so thanks to the existence of a particular rock formation across the world. In Chapter 357, after defeating an army of giants, Griffith and his reborn Band of the Falcon and come across a place that looks like Stonehenge. However, this isn't some sort of ancient sundial, it's a way to get closer to the sun itself. After having one of his apostles rearrange the stone pillars, Griffith and his medium Sonia take the entire army on a ride through the skies. They're able to reach Falconia within a matter of seconds, and it's a feat so unprecedented for the human mind that many of Griffith's human soldiers dub it his latest miracle. In reality, these stone pillar corridors are the in-universe equivalent of video game fast travel points. The actual path itself is created by the branches of the World Spiral Tree, which is why when you take it, it looks like you're gliding through the sky. Not only does the World Tree connect the three worlds mentioned in Berserk, it also gives you the means to travel through them without hindrance, provided you know how to do so. And speaking of enlightenment, let's talk about the second comparison Miura makes for his tree, which is with the Bodhi tree, under which Gautama Buddha achieved enlightenment. How Buddha's Bodhi Tree and the Kabbalistic Tree of Life influenced Miura's World Spiral Tree. Buddha became Buddha through a rigorous regime of meditation, fasting, and introspection as he sat underneath his Bodhi Tree. But that isn't the exact reference being made over here, we think. See, Miura using these comparisons is pretty meta in itself because he's relying on his reader's general knowledge of the world to land his references. What other mystical tree from a northern religion do you know of that connects different worlds? Let us know in the comments, we'll wait for that one, but on a serious note, the reason he brings up Buddha's Bodhi tree here isn't to say that the world's spiral tree is a place where enlightenment can be achieved. It would be more accurate to say that this is a place whose true nature can only be interpreted by those who are enlightened. Regular Falconians look at the tree and think it's a great blessing that's keeping them cozy and their harvest plentiful, but the real OGs know that it's doing far more than that. And just as a bit of a cheeky inside joke, maybe the sage that achieved enlightenment in Miura's story is someone we've already met, aka Void. We only say this because in chapter 138, Father Mosgus made reference to a certain sage that King Geiseric had captured in his day, who managed to make an angel descend with his prayers. That dude was locked up in the Tower of Conviction, which would have been part of the territory that Falconia stands on currently back in the day. As a God Hand member, and possibly the oldest one at that, Void would have complete knowledge of the way the world spiral tree works, and he's already been illuminated with the knowledge given to him by the idea of evil, which could explain his preacher-like talking style. But the point here is that the world spiral tree represents this idea of illumination and truth and reality that is both real and imagined to an extent. Real because it does open people's eyes up to higher truths, but imagined in that it isn't the truth that they think they're being exposed to. They're just ending up as fuel for the vortex of souls. That's why it has a magnetic effect on any that don't understand it. It's like the tree is connected to the very concept of life itself, which brings us to the final interpretation attached to it, the Western Tree of Ritual. Now, you'll find some sources online claiming that this is a reference to the two trees from the Garden of Eden, specifically the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if you look at it from a certain angle, that interpretation might fit as well. The tree of knowledge is what contained the forbidden fruit that got Adam and Eve banned from the Garden of Eden. When Geiseric's empire fell, the world forgot its true nature as a spiritual hotbed, and magic disappeared from the world, being gatekept by sorcerers like Shirke thenceforth. This could be because Geisrick messed around with astral forces too much, and him finding out included him getting banned from a human life and the fall of his empire. The serpent of temptation here is the idea of evil, of course, which tempted Void into sacrificing Geisrick's entire city in exchange for power. And the fact that humanity pretty much forgot about the existence of spiritual entities to the point fanatics like Farnese 
couldn't see them even when they were right in front of their faces, it adds on to that banishment theme of that entire Adam and Eve story. But go to the Dark Horse translation of the phrase associated with the Tree of Ritual once again and read it out loud. Here, we'll help you guys. Miura compares the World Spiral Tree to the Western Tree of Ritual that signifies the reason for all creation. This description is far more accurate when you take the Jewish Kabbalah's Tree of Life as the base inspiration instead of either of the biblical ones. Jewish mysticism has significantly influenced the world of Berserk, to the point that many of its elements were referenced in the story well before the World Tree entered the scene. We've only seen magic being practiced in two languages in the entire story, Sanskrit and Hebrew. The former is the Kushan interpretation of Arcana, which we will expand upon in another video. But the Hebrew is evident from the get-go, because Shirke's introduction includes Kabbalistic imagery and words as part of her ritual. She stands inside of a pentagram to perform her spells, for example. Many of the words of her incantations are directly lifted from the Hebrew language. The astral world's region of darkness is called Kliphoth, which is a reference to the evil counterparts of the Tree of Life's Sephiroths, according to the Zohar. And the Sephiroth themselves are referenced in the series, but in relation to the God Hand, not the good guys. The Kabbalistic Tree of Life is seen as a representation of the ten values that Ein Sof, or God, used to create the universe. This includes things like wisdom, knowledge, reason, and other valuable character traits. Berserk flips that concept on its head and introduces us to the guardian angels of desire in the form of the God Hand. When Guts and Skull Knight fight Slan and clip off, she states that her kinsmen have likely melted into their preferred Sephira and implies that they are waiting for the great roar of the astral world to be manifested themselves. That's exactly what we're shown in Chapter 307 as we see surreal depictions of the other God Hand members taking form in the physical world. This differentiation of each Sephira and the unique representation of them in Chapter 307 confirms that the Western Tree of Ritual is the Kabbalistic Tree of Life to us. And Miura did a damn fine job of simplifying and incorporating a spiritual concept that's pretty damn confusing to begin with. Though each of these trees have a separate meaning in their own respective religions, you can see how certain features overlap with each other. The God Hand still having their preferred Sephira to go into when the World Tree connects all three worlds of Berserk brings the total number of realms up to seven, which is just too shy of nine. Each tree separately represents life and the energy that flows through it, and this is reflected in the landscape around Falconia. Falconians are correct in assuming that the World Spiral Tree is the reason for their endless harvest season, but they're incorrect in assuming that this is a blessing. Why the World Tree should be Guts' next target, not Griffith. The reason the World Spiral Tree keeps Falconia in a state of perpetual bloom is because that's how spirit trees work. When Guts and his party entered Flora's spirit tree mansion for the first time, they noticed that the flowers were all in bloom, their bodies felt lighter, and their injuries were healing without the use of magic. All of these things are because of the spirit tree's presence, which not only attracts life, but also propagates it. Any land that's in the vicinity of a spirit tree will be unnaturally bountiful, up until the moment the tree is cut off. This is why when we reach Elfhelm, we see the entire island practically celebrating spring when we had just left snowy weather a couple of arcs ago. But there is more reasoning for our suggestion that Gus should go after the World Tree instead of Griffith, the biggest one being that it is now the source of all Griffith's major moves. The World Spiral Tree feels like a sole monolith in a barren garden, but the truth is, it's just the biggest tree in an endless forest of spirit trees. This forest is sort of like the anchor between the physical and astral worlds. Whenever people get closer to these anchors, they enter the other side, but with so many nodes spread throughout the world, each individual spirit tree drains the energy of the world tree, and some of them are powerful enough to oppose it as well. Griffith didn't go after Flora just because she was an extremely powerful witch that potentially possessed the knowledge to defeat him, he also needed to cut down her spirit tree. He's been on a mission to systematically eliminate every single spirit tree he can find in the new world because Number one, they remove competition to his authority, and number two, they allow his tree to run rampant. When Guts reaches Elfhelm, he meets an old mage named Gedfrin, who explains to him the true nature of the World Spiral Tree. He tells the gang to think of it as more of a fissure than an actual tree, because as we've established previously, that's pretty much what it is. The World Spiral Tree is a massive portal that keeps the physical and astral worlds connected. The spirit trees of the world are like individual parasitic nodes that stymied the growth of the world tree with their leeching of its powers. When Griffith started destroying spirit tree groves, he wasn't just taking out competition, he was preparing the path for the world tree's return. And once he had brought it into the world, he needed to make sure it stayed as the strongest magical power source 
as he was the one who had control over it. This partly motivated his attack on Elfhelm, because the Cherry Blossom Spirit Tree growing over there was the second largest spirit tree we've seen in the series after the World Tree. When Griffith destroyed it, every magical creature that had been accepted by Elfhelm's residence disappeared, along with the island presumably having been cast out of the merger and locked into an astral pocket dimension. But in doing so, he also showed us a way of beating him, because with enough planning and preparation, Guts's party could do the same to his tree, what he has done to so many innocent lives. Granted, the scale of this operation is unprecedented, and one of his allies is currently exploiting this enemy resource as you're watching this video. In Chapter 374, Shirke performed a ritual that cast her luminous body into the branches of the World Spiral Tree. She's currently on her way to Falconia to find a way to rescue Casca, and for everyone's collective sake, we really hope she finds a way to do that. But if she doesn't, there's another objective waiting for her to accomplish, and that is to figure out how to chop that damn tree down. Because what has worked for Griffith is bound to work for Guts and friends too. They just don't have the means to do it just yet. I mean, imagine Guts trying to chip away at that thing with his sword. Even if he went berserk, it would take him more time to cut down one of the world tree's trunks than he can afford. Using the sword of actuation to correct its mistake would be poetic, and it is possible considering its properties. And then there's always the chance that Daiba has some entirely new trick up his door that he's been hiding all this time. But the reason we're focusing on the World Spiral Tree as the next big problem for Guts instead of Griffith is that unless this tree is dealt with, the entire world will always be in a state of Fantasia. And if he's given enough time, eventually, Griffith will put every living soul into the pen that he's calling his capital city. Taking out the World Spiral Tree won't kill the God Hand, we don't think, but it will definitely put a major dent in the bonnet of the Age of Darkness. That will make it simpler for Guts to blow the engine apart, and by that, we mean taking care of business with Griffith. Once the tree's gone, all strategy can take a backseat to the action, and that's what the Black Swordsman has been craving anyways. Marvelous Verdict! But as for your cravings, dear struggler, we hope we've satisfied them because that's all we've got on this particular subject. The World Spiral Tree is by far one of the most layered symbols in the Berserkverse, and we think we did a good job of breaking down just why that's the case. But what do you guys think? Let us know in the comments down below. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you guys in the next one. Until then, keep on struggling, strugglers.